So as mentioned, this is a cross learning um, session between Aviro Health and some of our implementing partners. But I do know and I am aware and very keen to acknowledge all of our other colleagues who are joining us from today. Some of us who are from programming interested in learning about these different strategies that we are implementing on digital health. Some people are service providers. You are going to hear some of the reflections from service providers actually today. And I know that some of us here are joining us from that background and perspective. If you are someone who's interested in investing and looking into digital health, this is a space again for you to learn and understand how some of these um, implementations have been taking place. But we've also got people who might be students, activists, and other persons who are generally interested in learning about digital health. This is a space for you. And like I mentioned, it is an effort to cultivate a community of practice in this area of work. So we are definitely hoping that we will get to see all of your engagements and thoughts and questions to our speakers. So before we get into this, I wanted to introduce myself first. Um, my name is Nomti Kamjwana. I am a programs and communications practitioner in the field of SRHR and HIV and youth innovation. In the field of digital health specifically, I've been working for about three years now as either programs manager and officer, a service designer and a digital health rights researcher. And I have been and continue to work with Aviro on a couple of projects every other time. Um, I'll be holding the session for us today, but it is really an engagement that is open to and for all of us. And before we, we get into it, I would also like to introduce my speakers who are joining me, who you've probably seen. I'll quickly project my screen so you can see them again. Um, of course, we are joined by Dr. Masaid Abrams, who's the CEO of Aviro Health, um, and who will be reflecting a lot more on just the evolution of ATC. And then we've got Nom Tsebom Tim Kulu from the Health Systems Trust, who is also going to be reflecting as a special project coordinator implementing ATC in collaboration with Aviro. And then we are also joined by Upeki Weshongwe, who is with Eswatini MSF, and she is going to be re um, reflecting as a virtually supported HIV self-testing focal person. And I do want to fully acknowledge as well that we have some of their colleagues and other past and current implementing partners from Aviro Health who are also going to be joining us in today, who are joining us in today's session. So please feel free to jump in, drop information in the chat and share with us who you are. So I will start with asking each of us who are joining the session and the call today to quickly introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us who you are, maybe where you're from and where you are connecting with us from, whether it is your city or your country and what you are looking forward to today if you have time for that. In the meantime, I am also going to ask Masaid um, very quickly to just say hello. And I know I've already introduced you all, but a very quick two-liner. And then I'll ask as well, um, Nom Tsebo and Begiwa to just quickly say hello. Um, yeah, Musaid, I'll pass the mic to you quickly. Thanks, Umtika. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the, the Fakul Clinic webinar. Um, I see some uh, known acquaintances and some people that I, that I don't know, actually, and it's just make it exciting. Um, I hope that we can have a, a great session of learning um, from, our, from our different partners and then some great questions um, to come up as well. Awesome. Thanks, Masaid. Nam Tebo, are you there? Please say hello. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Nam Tebo Mtim Kulu from Health Systems Trust. Uh, I'm the Special Projects Coordinator, as Nomtika has introduced me. I'm very happy to be here today. And I do know that it's going to be a very interactive session and we will all leave with new learnings from this call. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Namtebo. Bekiwe, over to you, please. Hello again, everyone. I'm Bekiwe Shongwe. I'm with MSF Eswatini and I'm the focal person for the virtually supported HIV self-test pilot project that we're implementing with Aviro. Happy to be here and looking forward to the session. Great. And I am also happy to see some of our colleagues introducing themselves. Someone from Portugal, Eswatini, sunny Cape Town. Is it sunny? <laughs> and 
Stellenbosch University. Thank you so much to all of you. Please keep on introducing yourself. Just connect with everyone in the chat as well. So I will kick us off by starting with actual reflections from people who are implementing um, APC on the ground. And then as soon as we are done with that, Musaid, I will immediately jump straight to you and we can start chatting a little bit more. So please continue to introduce yourself. I will, and just give me a few seconds to share my screen. Apologies, colleagues, I'm hearing that the sound is on silent, so please give us one second. is very fast mm -hmm. and the AMA videos, when it comes to AMA videos, people, they learn more about HIV. Sometimes they 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 say, stop talking a uh, full counseling because I'm rushing. Mm -hmm. But when you, when, you, when you put the tablet like this, enjoy and see your video, you see the patient is happy. So now our counseling is going very well. It comes with a lot of technology that I think is also gonna be very useful for our youth. It's definitely going to be better because now it's going to make the implementation time a lot faster. And it's also going to allow us to even reach higher targets uh, as we are aiming at the 95, 95, 95. I hope to have, um, especially young people using the pocket clinic uh, and men, uh, because those are people that sometimes don't feel comfortable seeing cast counselors. But now with the pocket clinic, uh, I think you, young people should be excited in using the tests on their own and be able to test themselves. And then in terms of the youth, uh, I like the fact that it is technology oriented and I don't want to be to uh, very much into e technology. So Bazo Itanda is going to be interesting for them. But most exciting for me is the dashboard. The fact that wherever I am, I'm able to see the performance of the facilities um, from the district to the sub-district to the facility up to the individual performance. I want to see how many clients I did, how many uh, confirmed. I want to 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 see my states. And you see, see that I'm doing the job. So it, it enables me to promptly make monitor the performance and facilities. It enables me to actually be able to support the staff members that are not doing so well with uh, in terms of implementing the, the testing services. So for me, the dashboard just does it all because it means even if I have to prepare reports, I can just go straight to the dashboard and get the numbers. Yeah, what I like about it, our clients will take active participation in their own health because they themselves will be involved in the process of testing. It's going to give e patients a sense of responsibility and independence because uh, they won't depend on us. Uh, when I'm talking to my tablet, I like my tablets. Always, if you see me, I'm carrying just like this, like my baby. So it's very, very nice to wear those, those tablets. I'm new, but I'm enjoying it. Great. So those were the reflections from some of the health providers who are using um, APC to implement. Now, Musaid, I'm going to come to you because... The last time we were having a similar session, which was last year, it was also just before World AIDS Day, and we were launching and really evaluating and journeying with Avira from where we started to launching APC, which we have. And now we are very interested to hear the reflections on what that journey has been and what are some of the learnings and progress to date. 
Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Andika. Yes, I, th I think it's, it's, it's very important to reflect. Um, as you mentioned, last year, this time, we were in the process of upscaling um, Ithaca, which was, which was the previous uh, platform, and developing it into Pocket Clinic based on the, based on the learnings from, 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 the, from all the pilot projects that we've had. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, it's the wrong one. Please. I think this is just to give a, again a, a background and overview to what we're doing with Inabido um, and with Pocket Clinic. So our mission is to focus on empowering people through health journey support, and for that, for, for us, that means giving patients the right information at the right time, right? And we want to do that to lead to improved health outcomes. And the focus that we have is always on being patient-centered or people-centered. Um, and I think that's what builds engagement and trust and then data-driven as well. So, that, you know, which leads to efficiency. And those, the, and that is the focus that we have. And I think the reason why I thought we could start with those, uh, with those videos is because those healthcare providers are the ones that we're actually serving. So when we started out, we focused only on the patient. Um, the patient journey, and this is the patient journey that we see here, right? Um, a patient gets a trigger, there's some demand generation, which makes them think that they need to get testing uh, or start out on a health journey. Um, the challenges that we find at the facilities, um, you know, based on, on many focus groups, is that, you know, patients are put off by long queues by spending a lot of time. There's also a lot of uh, stigma around testing itself. You know, in the facility, there's no time for proper counseling. There's also a different quality of counseling depending on the on the depending on the on the on the history of the counselor, and in general, there's overstretched health services. And we'll speak more to that um, in this in this webinar. But there are a lot of funding cuts, staff cuts, which actually lead to more pressure on on the staff. And then lastly, what we what we really came to find when we were running our Ithaca was the lack of actionable data. So we decided to focus on that in terms of providing you know real-time data to two people in public clinics so that the data does become actionable um, this is just to describe the pocket clinic journey at the moment a uh, patient gets demand generation a nurse or counselor registers that patient in some of our projects they go to a booth based testing in other projects they have take-home testing uh, you know via whatsapp and then if the, if the patient is positive, they are linked to care. What is not shown on this image actually is this, that this boot based testing, it started out outside the facility, but it's moved now, especially in HST, in KZN, in the DUART project, it's moved out into mobile vans that go into the community. So wherever there's a private space for the patient, um, they, get to, they get to use pocket clinic. Then the patient gets linked to care and that gets fed into the, dash, in, in, into the dashboard for the, for, for the client. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we that we had when we first rolled out Ethica, which was which was a web app, was that a lot of people were asking us in in terms of access. You know, it's only for patients with cell phones, and that's a large reason a large reason why we decided to go with a tablet based uh, booth based testing as well, so that those patients that don't have access to to cell phones still have access to digital. When we, when we shifted our focus from the patient, because we completed that patient journey, we looked at the healthcare provider. So the first, I would say in Pocket Clinic, the first functionality that we looked at was how do we improve the healthcare provider's flow and efficiency? Um, and this is the healthcare provider facing part of the tool. Uh, you can see we can register new clients, we can look up existing clients. And, in, and as we heard from that, that counselor there as well, the, the data is then fed back to that counselor or healthcare provider to show them, you know, how they are how they are matching with their targets. The other part of the provider the provider tool is that we can have any kind of uh, screening mo modules put up, and these can be activated by the by the healthcare provider. A large part of the development of this platform was in making it very scalable, but also in making sure that if we needed screenings to be put in or health journeys to be configured, that that would happen very fast uh, and timelessly. On the, on the patient side of the tool, we have, as, you, as I think most of you know, 
um, we have a video counseling syllabus in which patients go through pre-test counseling, how to do an HIV self-test, um, reporting that result, and then having it confirmed by a counselor, and then the, the post-test modules as well. The patient then has the ability to receive a QR code, which can be scanned at different uh, places with, uh, with pocket clinic, and that's why how we can also track linkage to care. The patient can also get a self-test certificate because we found that you know in our in our project in Kenya, um, we had much more, we had a lot more reporting of results when we added the self-test certificate, and then they can get reminder and follow-up messages as well. The last, I would say, the last leg of the of the stool um, in terms of marketing is the data dashboards, and I think this is probably the most useful data dashboards that that that, that, that we find. So what we see here is real-time dashboards in terms of you know, how many tests are being done, the cascade, the HIV cascade on terms of registration, testing, uh, positivity result and yield, and then linkage to care, right? And uh, patients starting ARVs. I mean, I can show examples of this, uh, you know, later on if, if anybody has questions, but if, so those are the three components, a provider tool, a client tool, and the, and the data dashboards for the project coordinator. To date, we've had 75,000 patients that are served. We've shown that actually there's a saving in healthcare worker time. There's also a cost saving as well, and that can be shared later. Um, we have 2,000 treatment starts. We're in SA, Kenya, and Eswatini. I do want to give a shout out to uh, three guys who are partners in Kenya at the moment. Um, I see some of them on the call, but they're not part of the panel, but I do want to give a shout out to three guys and to TBHIV care as well. The other thing that we've, that we've uh, just recently launched on Diabetes Day is, is the di diabetic module for insulin patients for that healthcare provider to, uh, to prescribe accurately insulin and, and have the proper titration calculator as well. So these are the things that are possible, I think, in the new pocket that I, that I want to express is that the system is now scalable. We can better implement individualized health journeys and, um, and that's exciting to us. In terms of being responsive to what our clients are requesting, we've also completed the HIV treatment capture. So we're not only looking at the part of the journey where the patient is, you know, being diagnosed. We're also looking at the part where the patient is initiating on ARVs, um, and this is going to be implemented soon in in KZN. The the next part of 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 of, uh, of the improvements is this conventional HIV testing journey module, which we will also be implementing um, in January in KZN as well. So once these modules are available, they become available to everyone. And this is just the conventional HIV testing is to make it a more complete product. So we won't only be looking at HIV cell testing, counselors and nurses will be able to um, use the tool for normal testing as, as well and, and the data collection that comes with that. So, I think that's where I'm going to end in terms of, you know, where we were last year, what we were aiming to do with the, with the new platform and uh, some of the success that we've had. And then I think the rest of the webinar is a discussion around, you know, some of the learnings, some of the bright spots and, uh, and some of the challenges that we have when you're trying to roll out a, a digital uh, program in Africa. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Ms. Saeed. Um, there is a question, which is a pretty common one. So maybe let's get through that first. Will the Can the presentation be shared or is there any way where people can find some information um, if it's impossible to share the presentation? We will so share the presentation. Great, awesome. Okay, so thank you so much. I will, before I move to to you, Namtebo, I was just wanting to highlight some of the important things that you've reflected on Masaid around um, serving healthcare providers. I think that's not very common language, especially when we talk about um, user centered design and user centered care. We forget to see health service providers as users themselves, especially because of some of the reflections that we've seen around the fact that people, um, healthcare providers themselves do appreciate the fact that they can have access to a dashboard that can allow them to track their own progress. Um, so to hear from you, Nom Tebo, um, I really just wanted to first just pick it from the fact that there's a particular issue challenge that you wanted to address that led you to deciding on APC. Is it possible for us to maybe just take it from there and then you can chat with us around how you are implementing APC? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Namtiga. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, once again. 
Um, so we were facing a lot of issues. I think at the time when Aviro uh, joined us to work with us, it was during COVID. So we started working on during COVID. We were facing a low, or we were having a low number of clients who were accessing um, HIV testing services at the facility. And um, I think we all know that it was very scary for anyone to move around because um, people were scared of getting COVID and they did not want to be uh, at the facilities for a lengthy amount of time. So what we did was when uh, Aviro approached us, we realized that, no, you know what? We can actually use um, this platform or we can actually use this app to be able to, or to access a lot of people or be able to test people in a way that they are not afraid to, because if you look at um, the normal way that we, we provide um, HTS or HIVSS services, without the tablet, it would mean that the, the healthcare provider would be sitting with the client, um, you know, providing counseling, pre and post test counseling, discussing um, everything with the client um, about the test. So now if the client is sitting with a tablet for them, it allays their fears of catching COVID and they are able to sit in a booth away from the healthcare provider. So that's where we started. Uh, we introduced a booth-based uh, tablet assisted system. First, it was Ita Itaka uh, Engage. And then after that, we changed to APC as um, Musaid has explained. So we wanted to achieve more self-testing basically with the same or less number of staff because a lot of our staff was not well due to COVID. So we had to keep on uh, testing the same amount of people or even less, but with a less number of staff. So what we came up with was a structure that we were going to have three booths. Uh, one lay counselor is going to be able to man the three booths, which means that there is privacy in a booth. Each client has a tablet and the lay counselor is able to assist all these three clients to navigate through the app. So to streamline screening and make it more accessible, we wanted to empower our providers and we wanted to empower our clients as well with engaging automated counseling, reporting and linkage to services via the tablets in the facilities. So the clients also received earphones, so they are able to listen to the videos in private. We had scanner flows for screening and linkage to care for HIV SS, and the clients were able to choose which um, screening kit they would like to use. So we had a choice between Oracle and NCT. We also have a dashboard as one of the implementers has explained in the um, introductory video, where you're able to monitor the performance and we are able, we have an easy to manage access patient record and data entry. So uh, we were able to also, um, I know a lot of um, healthcare workers have challenges when it comes to uh, digital systems because we are so used to, you know, using registers and everything. So for us, that also meant that uh, everyone was excited. We're all very excited because for us, it was something that was new and um, you know, even when it comes to our young people, we knew that we needed to have more men access services to the, um, in the facilities. We needed to have more young people access services in the facilities. So this was going to assist with men coming because they know that I do not have to sit very long with a lay counselor whilst they explain, especially if it is a female lay counselor, they would like to have a man to man interaction. So this meant that if there is a tablet, they are able to, the lay counselor will pop in and assist and then she will step out again and then he'll be able to navigate as well as young people. We all know young people nowadays are tech savvy and for them, this is interesting. Um, for them, it, it, they are not coming across, they are not coming across a service that is boring per se, but they are finding something new that they are actually able to engage with. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Namtsaibo. I really found it interesting when you were mentioning how the implementing HST was also supporting in cases where other health workers were not feeling well or if they've had to take on other work as a result of the impact of COVID. So that was quite interesting to hear. 
And I, I have an interesting question for, I think, all of you, because this does go to Masaid and maybe Begue later as well around just the adoption in the initial phases um, for the partner, for the patient, for the health worker. But we probably will get to that a bit later. Begue, I will pass the mic to you um, to just hear from MSF Eswatini around the stage of implementation you're at and how um, what challenges were you also trying to tackle with APC. Please go ahead. Thank you, Nomtika. If you can just give me a second while I try to share my screen. No worries. Just let me know if you can see my screen. Very nice, clearly. Thank you. Oh, great. Yeah, so with us, implementation of the virtually supported HIV self-test, basically it's a pilot project that we are implementing in one of the regions in the Eswatini, so it's Shiselweni region. This is one region where MSF's main project in Eswatini is based. So just to briefly take you through our rationale for choosing the pocket clinic. So we have in recent years mostly increased focus on STIs diagnosis and care in high risk population, and this includes sex workers. So this increase in sexual health actually led us to more increased interest to actually try and improve the quality of screening, quality of diagnosis and care in HIV and STIs with the main aim of actually empowering patients and increasing patient centeredness. So from another pilot site that we've implemented within the Shiseloni region, mainly video observed therapy. So we have actually learned that digital health interventions are a pretty useful tool when it comes to empowering patients and increasing their self-agency in managing of disease. Just to take you briefly through some of the gaps that we have in our current setup. And by our current setup, I mean our setup without the pocket clinic. So in country, when it comes to HIV self-testing, we mainly distribute self-test kits for those clients that want to self-test at home and further for those that want to distribute to their partners. So there is uncertainty about the use of whether the primary or secondary distribution of the kits that we distribute. And then with us trying to maintain the 95-95, we actually are not sure whether some of these collected self-test kits end up being used. So, so this is one of the gaps that we are seeing in country. And then we'd also lack of a properly defined system on the follow-up of clients that actually end up screening positives with the self-test kits that they collect. So you do find that some users may decide to stay at home even after screening positive. So this is also a gap in our setup. And then mostly with healthcare providers being the one that conduct everything within a facility. So we also see the opportunity for the pocket clinic to assist that in this instance. And then we also do see poor documentation when it comes to pre-exposure prophylaxis services due to the fact that our PrEP module is not yet captured on the client management information system that the Ministry of Health has scaled up nationally. So this is also a gap in our instance. And then we do see unsatisfactory male and youth coverage when it comes to accessing HIV care in general. And then coming to use of the pocket clinic to try and tackle some of these things, some of these things. So we are hoping that the pocket clinic will help us to see whether we do increase the number of the HIV self-tests that are conducted and also see the positive yield and we are in a, able to, we are in a position now to actually see and capture ART initiation. And also with the pocket clinic, we are making use of counselors other than just nurses. And then we also hope we'll be in a position to better support men and youth accessing the services. And then we've also seen that we are able to access real-time dashboards when it comes to the data related to the tests that are conducted. So one other thing with our approach with the pocket clinic, we are phasing it in a way that we also hope to possibly introduce or pilot in the self-test kit. So these ones are not yet in use in country. So we would really hope to introduce INSTI to the Eswatini population specifically because of the shorter turnaround times. 
So also we are hoping with the pocket clinic to also support those that would say, yes, I want to do my self-test, but I'd like to do it at home. But instead, we don't want to lose people to say they took their test, they went home, and then we don't know what happened with them. So we are hoping that with us supporting patients' take-home journeys, we'll be in a position to actually try and increase linkages to care for either those that screen positive or negative. And then in the long run, obviously, we'd want to further incorporate other activities within the pocket clinic. And this includes PrEP initiation that can be captured within the pocket clinic as well. And also incorporation of STIs within the pocket clinic. And then further to conduct contact tracing using the pocket clinic, whereby it would be basically patient-led. So these are some of the things that we hope to address with the pocket clinic. So when it comes to the structure of our Eswatini pilot, we mainly have four pilot sites where we are implementing the pocket clinic, and these are all in the Shiselweni region, as I already mentioned that MSF's main project is in one region in country. So we have a community approach and a facility approach. So for our community approach, we have one big site, it is in town within Shiselweni in Tangano, and then one, is mobile web. That means the team moves around setting up at different localities dependent on which locality they'd be moving to. And then with the facility approach, we have two facilities and these are Lavumisa and Shangano. And then set up within the sites is as described here. So we just have rooms within the healthcare system whereby those users that come to say they are interested in the pocket clinic, they utilize those available rooms there, other than our community setup whereby we pitch cancelable to tents in the two setups that are there. And then just to ensure that we actually implement the pocket clinic and utilize it to its full potential, we've sort of tried to come up with like targets for the pocket clinic. And this, we put them at like 450. So we are expecting to at least get like 450 users from all of our four pilot sites. And then just to also make sure that we utilize the pocket clinic and we actually monitor our own progress. We try to put like a percentage coverage when it comes to males and the youth. So we put this at 25 for males and then 80% for youth. And then, Obviously, the pocket clinic is a new product for Eswatini, so we do need to advertise it, like create demand. So we do mainly targeted mobilization, and mainly we are supported by our communications team. And for guidance and support, also there is the communications team from the Avero side. And then when it comes to project management, we did learn from the get-go that our ownership of the application was, criti was critical for the success of the project. So we had to sit down and make some decisions to say, how do we actually set up at our pilot site so that everybody understands like the patient flow, is it all right? And then we also try to make sure that we do follow up visits to these pilot sites and show that our implementers are supported and then we also came around to say, we need to include our monitoring and evaluation leads within the project for their guidance as we implement this pilot project for its success. And then also we just have like standing meetings whereby we constantly meet with the Avero team because they are that side, SA, we are here in Eswati. So obviously we need to be in touch. So we mainly use like WhatsApp, and then phone calls for remote support, depend, yeah, depending on the agency of the matter that arise. And then obviously our collaboration is MSF and Aviro with the full endorsement of the Ministry of Health through Eswatini National Aid Program. And our overall aim, which is key, is that we just want to pilot the pocket clinic use and then hopefully learn and then be able to inform health policy discussions and decisions. So it will be dependent on the outcome of this pilot, whether the Ministry of Health ends up saying, you know what, we have seen that we, we actually achieved our objectives here. Maybe we need to scale this up. So we are along those lines. And then with our timelines for the pocket clinic, we were looking at piloting between four to six months. And then we obviously kicked off from the 19th of October. 
Yeah, so we just basically hoping that we pilot and then see how things go and then we achieve our objectives. Otherwise, there is great potential on where the pocket clinic could take us as Edward Swatini in addressing some of the gaps that we are seeing. And from the, because we already have gotten like access to the dashboard, it is a good thing to actually be able to see, to say, oh, this is how this pilot site is doing. They tested so many people and we are able to follow up if we see that maybe somebody wasn't willing to care to actually follow up. Oh, what happened with that one? So we're able to now follow up. So we are hoping for a success of this pilot. Yeah, I think I'll end there for now. Thank you, Nomchika. Thank you so much, Peggy. This was very insightful and absolutely great. Um, Nomtabo, I know you also wanted to share a presentation very quickly around just some of the ways in which you're implementing APC. Um, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready, Nomchika. Okay, Thank you. I think you should just be able to share a screen. Um, okay. Also for our speakers, some of our colleagues who are who are sharing the reflections, please note the questions. I think there's a question in the chat, which I will probably direct to you, Masaid, when it's time for a Q&A session around adapting pocket clinic for other interventions or at least to cater for other diseases. So please just keep that in mind and over to you, Namtab. Thank you, Namtika. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. All right, great. Um, thank you so much. So as I had discussed with you um, earlier, that COVID-19 um, actually hindered, hindered access to HCS services and the need for spatial distancing inhibited in-person um, interactions. So using the APC application and offline tablets minimize the duration of contact between the counselors and the clients in the facilities. So we chose APC as an additional HIV screening modality into our HST operations uh, because we needed an approach that would provide a more efficient, effective, and accessible HIV testing mechanism. So the client would not be waiting for a long period of time. So we're looking at innovative ways to target adolescents and we wanted to garner interest in men to, for them to be able to come to the facility and uh, want to get tested. So the APC intervention does not replace existing HIV assess activities or the standardized documents or the registers that we are actually using. It actually complements the program. So the use of the app, it enhances the promotion of health-seeking behavior amongst our clients. Uh, this speaks to the counseling videos that are on the app, and it also enables the collation of data for programmatic decisions. Uh, using the app on a tablet also en enables HIV assess data to be captured electronically. As Musaid had uh, explained earlier, that they are the data is able to be captured um, at real on, on real time. The program was soft launched in th at three clinics um, in Umbungundobu in October 2020. So these cl clinics were Taluza, Hawe, and Bumuza. So the APC was launched in February uh, in 2022 as a way to optimize HIV self-testing by introducing the booth-based and tablet-assisted testing. So if you will know, in KZN, we are currently um, offering assisted HIVSS. So the current structure for APC, um, we introduced the booth-based and tablet-assisted testing using ITAGA because we wanted to achieve more self-testing with a less number of staff. As I had already explained that we had one counselor who is actually manning three booths and is able to assist three uh, clients at the same time. And we are able to streamline screening and make it more accessible. Pocket Clinic also empowers the providers and the clients as well when it comes to counseling, because we have one message that goes out to all the clients. They are able to get these messages are NDOH approved. So they are able to get accurate messaging and they are able to make decisions. So we feel that it actually assists our clients when it comes to um, decisions, when it comes to their health, basically. So we have these tablets in facilities and uh, we have earphones that we give the clients as an incentive and they're able to listen to the videos because the videos are able to tell you if, if the client has tested positive, there is a video there is, that is able to address the client and give post-test counseling. 
So we do not want anyone, anyone else to be able to listen to those videos. So the videos come in three languages. So our Zoom speaking clients are able to engage with the videos. And as I've said, the clients are able to, to choose which test kit they'd like to use. And we're able to have um, to access our patient records and data entry, robust data capturing, including the location. So we also, as Musaid had said, we also um, embarking on community-based testing with the Duart program in Kanongoma in Zululand. So they will be able to have offline capabilities as well. They, they'll be able to use the APC in the roving buses. Currently, the districts that are implementing APC and the facilities in Mkungu Jobu, we have Hawik Mkungu Zakaluza. Those are the three facilities that we started the pilot on. And then we started rolling out to Mpokomeni, Mafagatini, Songonzima, Richmond, Ngaleni, Grange, Ndilwen, Dame, Valente, Taylor's, Frontville, Northdale Clinic, and Guapata. For Etegwini District, we have Umbumbulu that is implementing Zimbini, Umlazi H, Umlazi G, Haley Scott, Mpola Eddington Gateway, Clare Estate, Red Hill, Chatsworth Township Centre. In Zululand, we have Pongola, Queen Nolo Nolo, and Mojane. And we are adding the Duart uh, team from Guanongoma as well, where we will be um, actually piloting the community side of things. The key learnings that we've had was that um, with APC and working with the patients, this actually assisted us because as I said before, we are so used to paper-based registers. So this came across as, and of course, there are some challenges along the way because we do have people who are not used to using tablets uh, like myself, I'm not very tech savvy, but when it comes to APC, it was very easy for us to use and it was very easy for the, the implementers to actually uh, learn and be able to assist the clients as well. So for the clients as well, we do have videos where they actually spoke about how it was user friendly and how they actually enjoyed actually getting screened using their tablets. And we also have simple videos that clients could understand and it's available in a language that is chosen by the clients. As I've said, the healthcare workers appreciated, appreciated learning how to use the digital system and how to, produce, uh, how to provide HTS. So for us, this app actually came at a time where we actually needed for an intervention like this, because as we have spoken about 95, 95, 95, and at the end of the day, we actually would like to offer life-saving treatment to our clients. So if we are able to get all those young people who are afraid or were not very interested to come to the facility and are able to get men as well interested to come and get tested because they know that, no, I'm not going to be looking at this lady for a long amount or, or uh, an extended amount of time because of testing. I'll be just uh, you know, going through the tablet, getting counseling from the tablet. So it minimizes interaction with them so they are very happy with that um, and here we have the process um, that happens when the client comes the client is offered HIVSS which is marketed in waiting rooms we also um, have people or we have lay counselors who actually speak to the clients and they tell them about um, about APC and you know you find that people are actually interested they want to see what this actually looks like so if the client agrees, we pre-screen for the client's eligibility, the client signs informed consent statement, and then we enter the client's details into the HTS register. And on the tablet, and then uh, we, we have the unique identifier, no names are used. The client watches the pre-test counseling video. We reassure the client and their address and address any uh, questions or concerns that the client might have. Because uh, we need to bear in mind that as much as there are counseling videos, if the client feels that there are some questions that they have, then the lay counselor is always around for, to address all those concerns. So we, we assist the client to conduct the HIVSS test. As I'd mentioned that we offer assisted HIVSS. And then whilst the client is waiting, whether they use OraQuick or Insti, with Insti it's almost immediately, they watch the process counseling videos with their earphones. And if they get an HIV negative result, we re, there's reiteration of prevention mess messages and we are able to enter those results in the HCS register and on the tablet. As I had said before, that this does not replace the documentation or the registers that we use. We use it in conjunction, in conjunction with those registers. And we offer the client prep 
please bear in mind whether the client tests positive or negative. And um, if the client tests negative, then we are able to um, uh, give the client an, another appointment for the client to come back. And then we're able to send them through to the clinician so that they get offered all the services prep and other preventative services. Should the client test positive, then we need to go, go back and then we actually need to confirm and then we are able to send the clients to a clinician again. So there's, there's no client that's going to be asking, why am I going in to see the clinician, but other people are not. So all the clients are going to see the clinician eventually. So nobody, even when it comes to young people, and maybe they come in groups, nobody is going to think that maybe I've gone to see a clinician. It means uh, people are going to see that I tested positive. So we are able to manage it in that way. So here is a picture of us. Uh, we, were test, we were taking pictures with the tablets to try them out when we first started with the pilot. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mam Kabo. I think this common question that I had initially, I will keep it there and I will come back to you, Masaid. But before I do, I did want to encourage everyone. Um, Nam Kabo, I'm not sure if you were you stopped sharing your screen. Um, but I do want to ask about the adoption phase, especially because in most of our reflections, we, sh we shared about reaching young people, reaching men, men who have sex with men, reaching sex workers. Um, and I know very much fully aware as well that we're at different stages of implementation, but there's definitely a point of interest in how um, working with and reaching these communities has been in during the inception phase. I know you, you can also reflect on health workers because I know you've mentioned that they appreciate it. They appreciate having this tool and having access to a dashboard, but there's a difference between how they've come to work with it and appreciate it um, and when they were starting to adopt and to use this, this tool. So I wanted to find out just reflections from across the three of you around the adoption phase, but also now that the implementation has started regardless of how far it is, what is the one thing that you would consider to be working? So that will be my question to you. I'll start with you, Masaid. And I also do want to encourage um, our colleagues and participants to share in the chat any questions, but also if you are also working on in a similar digital health space and have some learnings to share in this regard. Adoption and what are the, some of the key things that are working? Please, Masaid, go ahead. Yeah, so for me, one of the key things you know, when we listen to the goals of all our clients, it was to increase male testing and to increase youth testing. And for all three of those clients, I think we have doubled the amount of males testing. And I think for MSF, it's 57% males that have come to test. And then also in the youth, we see a, you know, a, a large amount of youth actually taking up, this, uh, taking up this modality. So I think that for me is one of the, one of the key moments is, you know, that was the, it was specifically targeted at males and, at, at, uh, and, and young people. And I think that we are meeting that, we get to be meeting that target. Great. Thank you so much, Masaid. Nam I don't know if you've got um, any additions just specifically for HST. Um, hi, Nam Tika. I think for us, it was also to, to be able to attract or engage more young people and men to access services. So um, seeing that we are, at, I think at first, when we first started with the pilot, we did discuss that, you know what, can we at least see more men coming? Can we actually introduce this to them? Because if you look at uh, females, they, they do not have issues with getting tested. So with men, we, have, we, we normally get, you know, a sort of like, um, I don't know, resistance to accessing services. So for us, this meant that, okay, we know that men don't like to spend a lot of time at the facility. We know that men do not like, sometimes they would probably like to be um, treated or to receive help from another male. And considering that we are short of men at the facilities. So this actually came as something that would actually assist us so that the male client is able to engage with the tablet. The, the young person is able to engage with the tablet and it's much more interesting for them. And for staff as well, you know, obviously uh, we all know that when something new is introduced, not everyone is going to jump up and embrace it, you know, but, you know, as time went on, people started realizing, no, oh, this is very interesting. 
you know, because as well, when Avaro came to introduce us, to introduce us to the app, they actually came with innovative ways to actually uh, teach or to train the staff. So the, you know, everyone was very, everyone was very excited about it upon learning what it was about. But, you know, hearing about it, yeah, okay, so it's something else, you know, it's just an addition. But after getting to engage with it and getting to learn exactly what it does and listening to the messages that the client listens to when they are getting um, screened, you know, you, you start to think, no, this is actually an, an invaluable. We, we actually do need this. So I think everyone went through that process, myself included. So, you know, everyone um, ended up actually loving that app. Thanks. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Namsabo. It's good to know that there's these onboarding processes as well, because that's also what drives um, motivation and enthusiasm, especially from a health provider's perspective. Um, Becky, where? Can I, 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 yes, Masai, please go ahead. No, I, just, I just wanted to add to that because, you know, with some of the discussions with counselors, it's, it is a sensitivity as well. We, it, the healthcare worker thinks that, um, you know, a that, that the, the tool might replace them, you know? And I think that it's, a, it's something to have a conversation about because as, as Nomte was, Nomte was saying is that um, if, you, if you send to that healthcare provider, you can understand all of those, um, those barriers and challenges to even uptaking the tool and work towards alleviating that. So it, it's very much an indication around this is not a tool to, and it isn't a tool to replace healthcare workers or pharmacists at all. It is, it is a tool to, you know, augment their work and to make it better. And, and the, the thing that I found uh, really good was when we do, you know, counseling interviews, they feel like it makes their work faster, but it also, they feel like it makes their work better because the, the videos provide a sort of uh, guided conversation for, the, for, for patients. And that makes actually their counseling a bit, go a bit uh, easier. So I do think that is a reflection that, you know, some people actually have a hesitancy to that uptake of, of a digital tool because there's, there's a feeling that it might replace the, the jobs. Mm, absolutely. And I think the reflections came from the video as well, that once health workers are familiar with how the digital tool is supporting their work, then it becomes more appreciated. So thanks for sharing. Peggy Wei, I see you're already unmuted. Hey, Namtika. So can I quickly pass the mic to two of my colleagues? Eh? So the first one will be Michelle Daka. She's our activity manager who oversees our facility approach. And then the second one will be Futi, our communications officer. Just to speak briefly on how things have been since we started, and especially because this is a new product for us, like especially the communications team. Thank you. Over. Great. So we've got Michelle, I think, who's going to go first. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle. Thank you, Peggy, for, for that. Okay. What I have observed, observed so far from the implementation period is that uh, the young ones were very inquisitive uh, to know more about uh, the pocket clinic, and they were very happy. And the feedback which we got, it was like, it's very good, it's private, and... Um, from the healthcare workers side, I think it's also a relief of not talking too much, but just uh, giving our clients space to explore and maybe possibly ask questions whenever they are. And also what we noted is our target mostly was males, high risk populations. Uh, we noted that most of the males are also coming up and they are really happy about it, excited. Uh, so I hope we'll yield more results uh, in future. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, Futi, would you like to follow through quickly? Is it Futi? Am I correct? Um, yes, you are. Um, hi, everyone. My name is um, Futi Matonti. Um, in relation to the communications part, basically what we did uh, when we started off, we have um, multiple uh, social media pages uh, for MSF Eswatini. We have Facebook, we have um, a WhatsApp line, a WhatsApp direct line, we have uh, Instagram and we have Twitter. Um, so we posted there, we created posts that are for the people of Eswatini, so something that they can relate to. What we normally do when we post is that we generate content that speaks to our, um, our, our, our patients. Uh, that is, we use uh, pictures that are on the ground so they can see the area. 
they can relate to the area, they can relate to the service providers as well. So we use faces of the normal people that we use at MSF. So that makes people to be able to relate easier. And when they see them in town, they know that these are the people that are, are providing the service for us. And then in relation to our WhatsApp number, we have our WhatsApp number, uh, which is directed to us. Um, I mean the WhatsApp line. And I must mention that the pocket clinic is one of the most um, engaging posts that we have posted uh, so far. So we have quite a number. We recorded uh, over 100 uh, in a month. Uh, so people were really excited to hear about it. There is the element of privacy. There is the element of convenience. There is the element of being able to do things at your own pace, you know? So yeah, it did well even on that. And we uh, did a web story on it. It's currently available in English and in French and currently adopted by the Italian um, people as well. Uh, there's quite a lot of excitement uh, uh, around it. So in um, speaking to creating demand uh, for the poker clinic, I would say social media played a, a rather vital role because we are able, um, I think what is worth mentioning is that as MSF is working, we work only in only one region, whereas there are four regions in the country. So social media allows us to reach out to people who are also outside the region so that they are aware about the service that we provide in the region so that whenever they visit here, they're able to access those services. So with the water plan, we basically address all the questions that are out there. Uh, we're able to engage at the level of the patient. Uh, whenever a patient is texting in Swati, we respond in Swati. When they're texting in English, we make sure that we respond um, in English. And going back to the web story, I'm getting my um, thingy twist. Um, we have um, a couple of MSFs around globally that are adopting um, the, the web stories. So they are also translating it in, in their own languages. So basically to show what we're doing in Eswatini. And when it comes to retweets, we have a couple of Twitter pages. I mean, yes, um, belonging to the MSF Global Network that have actually posted. So it's something that is definitely um, has a lot of potential. It's something that still needs to be communicated about because a lot of people, um, especially on WhatsApp, but they were actually asking, can you get the videos on WhatsApp? Can you send some of these things to me? But we are not there yet, not too sure if we're going to that, towards that direction. But yeah, there is a whole lot of digital things are meant to um, come to or go to people to reach a broader audience at their own time. So there is a bit of that, that, okay, after watching, can I still get this so that when it's time, I want to do my own HIV self-test at my own space, at my own pace, can I have this app so that I'm able to do this thing um, on my own? So yeah, that's basically that. Uh, I think there's a whole lot of room for a lot of improvement, um, a lot of innovation, uh, which excites us. So yeah, that's basically it from my end. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Futi. And take, thank you for taking us back to the demand generation and community engagement aspect before they actually start using the app and sharing with us how you sort of present those stories in order to, to get, especially the communities we would like to reach um, interested. And what is great about that is that once people start actually using the tool, then they're quite happy with it as well. Masaid, I think you had tried to project something. I have a question to you, which is currently in the chat um, and maybe to the other colleagues if this is different, but maybe you can start us off with this. You know, I, I it was just, you know, in speaking on, on MSF and the feedback, um, I think Biki, we mentioned that they are, be, and I think that they're actually very responsive to the feedback. Yeah. Um, you know, when we look at the feedback coming through the system, and this is feedback coming directly from the patient to the system, you know, we can see that we had a number of comments where we said the technology makes this test exciting, the duration of the test is too long. Um, you know, I like that it's an easy way to test that 20 minutes is too, too much to, 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 to wait. And actually, when we look at all of the other feedback, it's a similar thing where we like the technology, the test is too long. And I think in MSF, you know, there was like a, a real uh, action taken or decision taken to say, oh, then we're going to try MC test because it's shorter, you know? And I think that that's coming, I, I don't know anything else where it's coming directly from patients to the healthcare provider and the healthcare provider making that change, well, trying to make that change immediately. Um, I think uh, there was a different reflection when um, it's Kuti that was speaking in terms of, you know, can I get these videos on, a, on WhatsApp? Can I, can, I, can I look at them in different ways? And I think, I don't know, Mary Lou is on the call here. Mary Lou is from Tigrais in Kenya, um, where we were, we were supposed to actually do a normal group-based testing, but was actually taken to, taken to pharmacies or pharmacists. Um, and again, you don't, you, don't, you don't have full control over how the technology is used. But in that case, 
what they were doing is they were registering one patient, but having a group counseling with the videos. So that is something that we, I don't know if maybe Lewis say anything, but that is something that we, we look towards. How are people using the innovation in, in, in ways that you, that you didn't think was, you know, that, that, that could happen? And how do we adapt to that, to those demands? Uh, for MSF, we are, create, we are going to create a WhatsApp chatbot, um, you know, link to, uh, to Pocket Clinic for results reporting. So we will be able to uh, supply, supply content as well. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Saeed. That was actually going to be my other question. Can you um, stop sharing the screen, please? Yeah. Um, to ask across the, the panelists and maybe the colleagues whether there's been a difference in how APC has been implemented in terms of what we had expected it to do versus what has come out of the implementation phase. But before we get to that, and the next steps, there is a question from Ophigila in the chat, which I think is important, and it's asking, in capturing the patient data, how is the unique identifier generated? So what kind of unique identifier do you use? Is this something that is different across implementations, or is there a specific approach for a viral? I'm going to ask Alex uh, Fisher to respond. Great. Great. Alex, I hope you are here. I'm just trying to get more of the team to talk. Yes. If you are, Alex, please raise your hand. Yes, we can see Alex. So Mary Lou as well, I did not necessarily see um, see them on the list, but if you are, please feel free to raise your hand and to join and maybe feedback from Triggerize. So Alex, are you with us? Sir, I am uh, with you, but I'm actually calling in from a cafe. My internet's a little spotty today, so I thought it'd be a bit better here. Um, could you just repeat the question there, Masai? Uh, yes. So the question. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, um, Masai. But the question is um, the unique identifiers. How we generate unique identifiers when capturing patient data? So I think um, you were asking about the unique identifiers. Um, what we do, it's called the client ID, and it's a system-generated um, random identifier that's actually assigned to every single user once they register. And the reason that we do it this way is because we've built out a relational database and this identifier allows us to connect all of the different tables in our AWS system so that we're able to pull on different pieces of information from that. We then use that client ID and every single journey that that client goes on is also connected with just a generic ID that relates each journey back to the client ID. Um, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if um, Ahmed is on the call. He may be able to go into a bit more detail on the technical back end. No, I, I think that I think that's enough, Alex. I think the follow up question was you know, because there's so much double or triple testing. And this is something that we came up against in, in terms of in terms of HST as well, where, um, you know, people would go through a test, they test positive, and then the counselor would go, you know, to the facility, open up a folder and see actually that this patient is either known HIV or known HIV on ARVs. So, you know, in the system, we do have that identifier. And if that patient comes back with an, you know, ID number, passport number, folder number, we will be able to, to actually see that that is that same patient coming back. Um, but whether you can pick it up for the first time, it's, it's, it's harder to do. Yep. Um, sir, I see that um, there was a follow-up question about whether they can maintain that unique identifier. And um, we actually kind of preempt that at the end of self-testing journey. We give the user the opportunity to get a QR code generated that links to that ID. They can get that sent right to their phones. So that way, when they come back to retest in six months, there's no searching for the last name, their date of birth, their phone number. They can just pull up a screenshot of that QR code and directly from the pocket clinic tablets, they can scan that and it goes right to their client profile. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Thanks, Masaid. And I hope that was helpful, Pigile. Um, 
So now I'm going to, just before jumping into our final questions and remarks, remarks for our panelists, I'm going to give a few minutes if anyone is keen to ask a question, share any reflections, um, please feel free to use these next few minutes for that. Please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, I'd like to say, I'd like to ask something. Hey. Yes, please go ahead, Futi. Great. Um, one of the things that came back mainly on WhatsApp was um, you find a patient who is coming back. Let's say a patient comes back after three months um, and then they want to test again. They've seen the videos um, and they've done the test um, three months back. Is there a way, not of making it, um, of compromising the information, but somehow making it shorter? Um, there was that, that um, most of the time, um, most of the things I was saying in relation to HIV are things that um, have been said quite a number of times. So is there a way of not of somehow speeding up the process, uh, but not compromising the information still? So can we cut it to be shorter than the, 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 the normal time when they're coming in for the first time, especially because the thing is when you're going back um, for a test again, you find that the, the pre-counseling you still remember. Um, some of it, if not most of it. So is there a way of making it, of, yeah, of shortening it somehow? So at the moment, what we're doing is, what, what, we're, what we're going to do is that the first time you're going to the system, you have to watch the pre and post these counseling videos. Um, but when you are repeat, the counselor has an option to skip it. So the, or the patient has an option to skip it. Um, and I think that, that that is how we're going to deal with that. We are looking at, um, ways of giving the counselor more autonomy as well in terms of uh, deciding when a result must be reported. And that's going to be in the new update, um, you know, up in, in January when we put up the conventional testing. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Futi, and thanks, Masaid. And I think this might also be speaking to one of the reflections I think you might have shared in one of your slides, or it might have been one of the, the feedback shared um, by our speakers around having too many videos on the app is that something that is that can be addressed outside of just skipping the videos as well given the necessity of the content that is in those videos yeah i think when they're talking about too many videos there's a specific part where there's a waiting room and mm -hmm. that's the part where there's a library of videos that anybody can watch but that is usually because um, you know some one of the tests takes between 15 and 20 minutes to to report back. So in that time, they don't have to watch anything. It's just a waiting room. Um, but I but you know I, I we believe that you have to watch pre pre test counseling. You have to watch post test counseling. You know I, I understand if you come back that you don't need to watch pre test counseling again within three months etc. And that can be you know we can program that. But I I do think it's important. You know these videos are. Three and a half minutes long. They're not. They're not. Sorry, I'm looking at Kentika. Yeah, they're not very long, and the information is important. And I think that uh, you know, you, some things, some things can't be speeded up. Mm. Uh, so that's what I, yeah, yeah, Just from a medical point of view. Yeah. yeah. No noted. So we are exactly twelve minutes before we end our session. And I just wanted to reflect to get some reflections, especially from our speakers before we get to you, Masaid. Um, with your current implementation and some of the learnings that you've picked from APC, what is your next step? And I know I think Peggy, where you started us off in just telling us what are some of the things you're looking at in your phasing, but what is essentially what are you continuing to work on? What is the next step from here for APC and your implementation? So maybe we'll start with you, Big Iwe, and then we'll come to you, Namtsaibo Musaid, you'll probably wrap up for us as our final remarks. Thank you, Namtika. So as you've already seen for us, this is pretty much our first month into implementation. So we can't yet judge whether we've utilized the pocket clinic fully, but yeah, the results we are seeing are quite promising. So we are quite happy with them. So I think for us basically is to just try and 
come around with our targets to actually see that did we like place our targets like more reasonable or do we need to try and adjust so those are sort of our next steps i think i mentioned that we put them at like 450 and when alex presented our data for the first month they, we were at like 150 users for the pocket clinic from all our pilot sites so we do want to try and adjust our targets to sort of be more like reasonable so that they still guide us in monitoring of the progress. I think that's it from us. And then just monitoring the pocket clinic use and whether we do encounter like questions. And, and then as uh, Musad has just mentioned it, so from the feedback that we receive from the pocket clinic, we have actually been able to use that feedback to advocate for the introduction of ESD. So it was quite helpful, the feedback that we receive on a daily from clients that come in to use the pocket clinic. So we are actually hoping now to actually start introducing ESD and then see whether we're able to improve with our users of the pocket clinic. And that's it on my end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Begiwe. And I do think I stand corrected, but I think Beth's comment in the chat is to you. It says, as you monitor, it would be interesting to find out if people from other regions come to access the service in Shiselweni. Um, so that's just something to be noted, I think. And then um, I will pass the mic to you, Nomtsebo. I'm also just trying to keep track of the chat as well, but Nomtsebo, please reflect as well around what are some of the next steps that you are looking at um, based on your learnings to date in your implementation? Um, thanks, Namtika. So moving forward, because <clears throat> um, when it comes to linkages, you know, if our clients should, they get screened and they test positive, we need to ensure that we are able to link all of them. And we were actually speaking about introducing conventional testing onto the APC. And uh, Musaid actually mentioned the art initiation uh, module as well. So I'm actually looking forward to that. And we are also going into the community, as I mentioned that we are rolling out to the DoArt team. They'll be rolling out APC in the community. And we're actually uh, waiting to see the results from there. Um, how it's going to um, go down. But basically that is it and we will be continuing and we are actually trying to get more involvement. Our DOH colleagues are involved already, uh, but we want to get more involvement across the board. But um, yeah, so for now that is it. Uh, we have been training DOH as well. So they are also um, part of the implementers, which is a good thing for us. Um, but yeah, that is our next steps for now and maybe looking at um, moving to other facilities as well, because if you look at the number of facilities, um, it's just, I think, about 15 for Umgungo, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, actually ro rolling out to other facilities as well. Um, I feel that and maybe even going out to um, institutions where we find more young people, you know, and going to places where we find more men like Izibaya Zamatota, for instance, or, you know. <laughs> so for me, I, I have a lot of these ideas and, and, you know, next steps for APC. But yeah, we are still in discussions and yeah, it, we, we will reconvene and I'll tell you how everything is going. <laughs> Thank yes. you. I'm also just so that we, because we're on record, I am also just asking people to reflect and share on what they would like to explore and people aren't really signing on to anything on here. So thank you so much to both of you for sharing. Musaid, before you get to reflecting on just the next steps, particularly for APC, there's a question in the chat by Eddie, which asks, is there a follow-up on clients? Usually they have more questions after testing. I think the example that videos being accessible and shareable via WhatsApp might be like one of the examples to that. But he's asking, like, is there a WhatsApp that they can engage on or any way they can connect if they've got more questions after testing and going home? Mm. So usually what is happening is our, our clients like HSC or MSF, they're the ones that are interfacing with the patient. However, um, as I mentioned before, we are going to expand onto a WhatsApp chatbot for the take-home testing. And, they, and we, we're definitely going to make um, more of the content available because we know this, we, we've had a WhatsApp chat before in Kenya, and we know that people not only engaged in the journey, they were also looking for information through that WhatsApp. They were coming back 
you know, again and again to come and look for certain information. So we're going to build out that chatbot, not only to support the journey, but also um, also to support, uh, you know, questions, et cetera. Thank you, Masaid. I hope that was helpful, Eddie. And Masaid, I don't know if you have any more next steps to share with us or just general closing remarks as we are finishing up our beautiful session. No, I, I think just to, just to start off with, you know, Bikiwe had mentioned um, that one of the one of the one of the prime sort of directives for them was that they have to take ownership of a digital intervention, and I think that is so important. You know, none of this none of these results uh, can come about when when our when our when our partners don't take that ownership of a digital. It, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of uh, training, education, and and you know, on ground support to 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 get to all of these. To get to, to all of these results, and I, I do want to thank them, but I think that is an important, uh, I think is an important consideration for new partners is you know how much ownership can you take for that digital intervention. In terms of what's coming next, I'm excited because you know in, there are new modules that are coming up. So you know MSF wants SDIs. Um, we're gonna we're gonna add more for diabetes. So the NCDs will be covered. Um, hepatitis C, conventional testing. So those are all the journeys that are that are coming up. But I'm also excited for some of the partnerships that, that are coming up. We're having you know, a good discussion with uh, Final Mile, who do, uh, who do great work on patient segmentation and sort of how, you know, how can we use the work that they've done in patient segmentation, for instance, in, 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 in KZN for adolescent girls and young women to see if we can get tailored journeys so that more, more young women you know, have a, a, a better uptake in ARVs, but also in PET, for instance. So that, so, you know, final mile, we're also having discussions with, you know, with digital incubator, um, especially, you know, around this issue around, uh, of lab results um, and can it be communicated to the patient, you know, what, what, what are the benefits if you have the health record from, from what, we, what we're capturing and, that, and those lab results, um, what, what are the benefits for the, for the system actually? Um, so those are the partnerships that I'm, that I'm quite excited about. Um, the disease verticals are being added, and actually we're going to, once those modules get added, it gets added throughout the system, you know, so I think we're going to, we're going to see a bigger impact. I think that we, I think we're at that point where we want more of our, more of our partners to scale. So scale up, scale up the number of clinics, scale up the, the number of patients uh, going through the system and seeing what that data can, uh, can result in. Great. Thank you so much, Masaid. And thank you so much to all our speakers. I think I was I was quite um, happy to note some of the very common needs for patients that also exist offline around privacy, time, confidentiality, and having engaging counseling and content really being implemented within this digital space, including a thorough thought through from Alex's reflections around how we uniquely identify people that use APC and how to avoid these duplications that um, I think Figila was reflecting on earlier, but also being able to cater and to really think and put healthcare providers at the center so they can also be able to track their progress, um, but also have, um, less time that they would have to spend counseling patients and focus more on providing um, other aspects of that service as a holistic quality service. So I would like to thank all of you for staying on. Still having 40 people on a webinar in an afternoon is really great. So we really thank you for your time and for your engagement. Um, it is discussions that as a viral, um, we hold every other time, and it would be very great and interesting to hear from you within this context of the work and what Avaru is doing, what else you would like for us to chat about, discuss, and engage on in the coming year. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Please feel free to connect with us on social media, online, and feel free to reach out to us as well on those platforms should you be interested in connecting more with the speakers or with Avaru Health. So thank you so much. Can our speakers please show their faces again, just so we can say thank you. There's Begiwe. Thank you so much, Begiwe. Thank you, Musaid. Thank you. Thank you, Nom Tebo. Um, and thank you so much to all said, of you. Okay, yes, please feel free. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say thank you to, to our team at Avido. And thank you to the partners who, who trust us and take us on as clients. Um, and, and thank you to our funders as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, colleagues, and we will connect again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nomtika. Thanks, everyone.